The following video is intended for adults only. It is not safe for work in any way. Please make sure you don't watch it around your coworkers, your kids, or your grandma. This is your final warning. And if you are under 18, don't tell your mom. I've been in Japan for almost 20 years, and now I present to you the strangest, weirdest, and most profane thing I have ever found in the Land of the Rising Sun, a manga series about Hulk Hogan. You might say, really? Was Hulk Hogan, and by extension the WWF, that popular in Japan to warrant its own comic series? Well, the WWF and New Japan actually cross-promoted their stars often in the early 1980s, so Hulk Hogan and many other names of the day were well-known in Japan. The manga series is called Yappa, a Hogan Yo, meaning in English simply, Hey, it's Hogan! This whole time, these books have flown under the radar of the English internet, which has basically been a constant one-up contest of who can deliver the most obscure things to make fun of. So, I submit this to you. Can anyone top this? Maybe. And if so, I'd sure like to see it. The series was written by Minoru Shibayama and published by Kodansha Media. Yep, the same group who made all those Nintendo manga books I'm always talking about. From personal experience, I'd say that the audience and age range of Nintendo fans and WWF fans overlap, especially back in the 1980s. But these two series couldn't be further apart. The Mario books got a bit risque at times, but nothing too bad for boys just being boys. But the Hogan books are a whole nother planet. Hogan's schlong is out on nearly every page, and he's not the only one. There are tons of obscene jokes, and if overt sexuality isn't enough, there's a few scenes that get pretty gory too, though in a cartoonish way. The series began in May 1984, not long after the Hulkster started his first WWF title run after defeating the Iron Sheik. Since this thing happened over 30 years ago, and Kodansha doesn't actually exist anymore, there's not much known about the books. I do know that there were at least six books made, all of which are pretty hard to find. I found book number three, which was hella expensive as far as books go. The books are not one continual storyline, but rather a collection of individual stories told every week. They're pretty short. Some are only two pages, but a few make it to six. In book number three, there are 40 stories, and I'm going to pick the best ones from here that are the funniest and easiest to understand. I mean, some of the stories feature old pop culture jokes that were funny in Japan 40 years ago, but we wouldn't really get. It's kind of like if you went to a foreign country and told a where's the beef joke. Funny to us, no one else gets it. They also feature some Japanese pro wrestling talent we might not know, and honestly, I don't know. So if you can actually figure out who some of these people are, let us know. But some of them do feature recognizable WWF superstars, or just have stories that are simple funny gags. It's not a countdown of the best per se, but I will put my favorite one last so you can end this video with a big laugh. Oh, and there is one more thing. Another Japanese company did put out a graphic novel about Hulk Hogan that accurately chronicles his life from bar band bass player to WWF champion. It's actually pretty good, but that's not what you came here for. You came here to see this. So, let's get right to it. The first story is for all you gamers out there. It's called Famicom a Hogan. The story starts with Hogan showing off his WWC championship belt, and afterwards he locks it away in his wang-shaped locker and says, it's time to play some Famicom. That means video games if you aren't a gamer, which I'm sure everyone here is, but you never know. I know what you're looking at, and yes, it's hysterical. His Fu Manchu is using one controller, and his dong and ball bag are using the other. But what is he actually doing with his hands? Writing something? I have no idea. 
Anyway, after a long play session, he decides to go to sleep, and no comment on his sleeping position. But in the middle of the night, suddenly the lights flick on, and Mario and Ninja Jaja Maru-kun show up to steal Hogan's WWC title belt and run away with it through the TV. This is ironic to me because in the Super Mario Land manga, which came out later, Mario meets Hogan in that book too. Hogan jumps right in after them and is put right inside a video game. It's a stretch, I know, but they do try to make you feel like it's a game with things like power meters and jumping platforms. Hogan has to endure a 5-on-1 handicap match. To win, Hogan takes an oscillating fan and vomits into it. The vomit turns everyone into flying turds who are blocking Hogan's belt. Hogan says he knows the right technique and stomps on each turd and then lands on his belt, which sends him back to the real world. Mario and Maru can comment on how Hogan is such a skilled Famicom player. But wait, I guess it was all a dream. This story is called The Impossible Task. The story begins on a crisp autumn day. By the way, these things are supposed to be read in real time, so it's November 1985 when this one was published and the comics reflect that. Hogan is studying in the library. His head often displays in Japanese whatever he's thinking or feeling or doing right now. And right now it says study. He's so serious about it that he freaks out to scare anyone off so he can sit alone and study. Then a cute girl shows up and Hogan is lovestruck. She says she can't find a seat and Hogan makes sure he can offer her a seat right next to him. The girl is impressed by all the books he's reading and he says he's studying to be a doctor. His forehead says gynecologist. Tee hee. She thinks that's admirable and he says to himself that she's falling for it. Then Animal from the Road Warriors, later known as a Legion of Doom, spots Hogan and tries to be friendly and say hello. He tells him to beat it, lest this girl prefer him over Hogan. When the girl asks if Animal and Hogan are friends, he denies it. Then Animal flips open Hogan's skull and takes out his brain and removes it with a giant soft serve looking turd. Yeah, these things go way back, long before emojis. Hogan and Animal bicker a bit, but eventually this girl's boyfriend shows up. He's a total slob and has a flatulence problem on top of it. He says, let's go see a porno movie, and off they go, leaving Hogan all alone. This story is called Secret Power. Hogan is training and the other guys are shivering and have fevers. It's supposed to be winter to help fill this out. But Hogan is showing off how strong he is and how he can't get sick no matter how bad the weather is. Then he tells everyone in the gym that's because his wang has the power of the tiger. Yeah, I looked it up and 1986 was the year of the tiger. So maybe every year they did this gag with a different animal of the Chinese zodiac. Hogan continues to prance around naked while the other guys warn him he'll get sick if he doesn't cut it out. Eventually, lunch is served, a giant slab of beef. Hogan cuts himself off a big piece, but instead cuts right through his hand. Now, I can't actually follow what's going on here, but somehow Hogan turns into a cow, which would have been the year before the tiger. Everyone runs around trying to find a cure, but eventually they decide they need to drain the cow blood out of Hogan, and when they finally do, he returns back to human form, while all the guys in the gym drink his blood. What the WWF is going on here? This story is called Santa Claus. Yeah, it's Christmas time. Hogan and I think Dump Matsumoto are walking past an elementary school and see some kids having fun with an RC race car. The kid who owns the car said it was a Christmas present. One boy looks a bit down, and that's because he didn't get a Christmas present. This moves Hogan to step up and volunteer to be Santa Claus and be a big brother to all the world. He puts a pair of antlers on Dump and off they fly. But along the way, Hogan spots a girl's dormitory and some laundry hanging on the line. He takes some bras and just goes total pervo on them. Oh, and by this time he's naked. 
Eventually, the police catch up with him and threaten arrest, but Hogan jumps down from the building wearing all the underwear he stole, scaring the bejesus out of the cops. The whole thing ends with Hogan being shot at. This story is called Powerful Momoko-chan. Hogan is hanging out with the road warriors, and he tells them he's getting ready for a date. Hawk thinks the date is an orangutan, but Hogan assures him it's actually a very cute girl. There's a knock at the door, and Hogan's date, Momoko-chan, is there. The road warriors think she's so hot, they spooge in their pants. But the reader has only seen her face at this point, on the next page, they get to see how she really looks. Yeah, she's a bodybuilder. Animal quips that at first it looked like Beauty and the Beast, and now it's just the Beast and the Beast. Hogan and Momoko-chan hit the town, and Hogan says, let's go see a porno movie. Is that some kind of running gag? Then, someone in the crowd steals a backpack and runs away. Momoko-chan throws an unknown projectile at the criminal, knocking him down and then sits on him to keep him at bay. She returns the backpack to the rightful owner, but what exactly did she throw at the perp to stop him? Well, she ripped off Hogan's head and threw that. Did you know Hulk Hogan had some TV commercials in Japan? Let's take a break, and when we come back, some even crazier stories are on the way. この番組はご覧のスポンサーの提供でお送りします。Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday comes again. 毎日毎日日木の細長は静か、サラサラ、綺麗な空気。体には細長が気持ちいいんです。日立のビッグフロー、ウェルネス。細長は日立。ワンダフラップで床面からどんどん暖かい。細長。日立のビッグフロー。Wow, no wonder they call him the Huckster. The next story is Conditions of Pro Wrestlers, and it features Superfly Jimmy Snuka, Davy Boy Smith, and the Dynamite Kid. The three of them show up at Hogan's gym. Hogan takes one look at the three of them and says they're too small and don't have any muscle. Hogan even pets Davy Boy like a dog. Don't say it, I know. Like a British Bulldog, ha ha ha. Well, the three of them gang up on Hogan and say you don't need to be gigantic if you've got speed. Meanwhile, someone sneaks into the gym and slips a poisoned can of cola into the machine. Enough to kill a horse, the mystery man says. Superfly Jimmy Snuka says he's thirsty after giving Hogan a beatdown. Which, by the way, lets you know this is fiction, because when would Hogan ever job to these guys? No offense to Davy Boy, Superfly, or Dynamite Kid. Snuka gets a can of cola, the poisoned one in fact, and Hogan swipes it from him and takes a drink. Hogan freaks out and says it's poisoned, and asks to call an ambulance. But Superfly, Dynamite, and Davy Boy just split the scene. Which means they just left him to die. But then, Hogan stands up and says now that they're gone, he can have the can of cola all to himself. And that's the end of the story. I guess he, like, doesn't die? I don't know. Oh well. What's next? You'll love this one. This story is called Cinderella. Hogan plays the part of Cinderella, while Ricky and Animal play the mean stepsisters. Of course, they make him cook and clean and be their servant. But when he does a lousy job of it, they throw him out of the house. While he's outside, he takes a leak. Then Hawk appears as the fairy godmother and uses his magic to give Hogan a beautiful dress and a coach shaped like a dong, complete with a pig, to drive it to the castle. Don't forget he has only until midnight, 
then he's gotta come back. He shows up and immediately ruins everything by taking the prince and holding him in a bear hug, killing him. A fight breaks out with the royal court. All these parts are played by other wrestlers, as you can tell. And Hogan ends up fighting with them until midnight. Which, after that, his clothes turn to rags and he makes an escape. The cops are looking for him because, don't forget, he murdered the prince. Well, to keep things tied to the Cinderella fairy tale, the police go looking for the suspect by taking the glass slipper and having everyone in town try it on. The cops show up at Hogan's house and to beat the rap, he takes a giant mallet and smashes his feet to an even bigger size. And since the shoe doesn't fit, you must acquit. This story is called Officer Momoko-chan. Yeah, she's back. The story starts with Momoko working her day job as a police officer. Someone asks her where the closest gas station is, and she says that if he's out of gas, she'll just carry the car to where he needs to go. Hogan spots her and the two catch up and get reacquainted. It's been about six months since they last met after all. But remember, she's still on duty, and so when a kid walks in the path of a car, she leaps into action. She puts her hands into the ground and rips the concrete out from under the car like a rug to stop the car, and Hogan saves the little kid. But Hogan stubs his toe and says he hurt his foot. Momoko-chan says she knows something she can do to make him forget all about his hurt toe. I know what you're thinking, and we're all thinking the same thing. She rips his arms off his body and says, does your foot hurt anymore? Of course not. This story is called Women Are a Weakness. Hogan just successfully defended the AAWA heavyweight title. A delivery girl shows up with everyone's dinner order, and Hogan sees her, and because he thinks she's so hot, his schlong turns into a snake, and he demands both the food and the girl. Another wrestler, I actually can't tell who it's supposed to be, comes to her defense, and they take it to the ring. On the line is the girl's honor and the title. The match starts, and they go back and forth. Eventually, Hogan drops Trowel and takes a dump on his face. To distract Hogan, the girl flashes him and everyone else in the arena. But Hogan hulks up and gets ready for the famous leg drop. So the delivery girl gets desperate and gets fully naked. Then she jumps on Hogan's face, tackles him, and he lays down for the three count. I mean, wouldn't you? The delivery girl is the winner of this bout. And new AAWA champion. That's all for this episode. Will I revisit these books someday? Yeah, probably, but that's up to you. Tell me what you think. I hope you've enjoyed this deep look into one of Japan's and wrestling's greatest lost works. In some cases, a very deep look at things you'll never find in the squared circle, but it's all in books. <laughs>